So everyone, thank you so much for coming. This is part two of Career Pros. This is Ad Night. We are thrilled to have you on the Zoom and we're excited to hear from some alums in the business who can give you some real world you know, experience that they have and how to get your foot in the door and all those good things. So we're gonna get, start by kind of giving the panelists a second to introduce themselves and where they work and give us a little background around, about themselves. So Rachel, you wanna start? Yeah, sure, I'll start. So my name is Rachel. I was a 2014 advertising grad. So it's funny because Bailey and I were both 2014 advertising grads, but we did not meet each other until this board. So interesting to see how Penn Staters, you, you keep growing, keep meeting people as you go along in your career. Uh, so I, as if you guys were eavesdropping before, I live in New York. I currently work at Madison Square Garden in our digital partnerships department currently under the Nix property. So I essentially, the brands who are advertising through our property, I'm managing the distribution strategy reporting of their assets. So I think that's kind of how it relates to advertising. I've been in the sports and entertainment partnerships or marketing space now for six, seven years. So excited to be here. Awesome. Lauren, you want to go next? I would love to go next. Hey, everyone. I opened up the chat also, so we see you in both places. Um, my name is Lauren Conway. I graduated from Penn State in 1997. I did not major in advertising. In fact, I wanted nothing to do with advertising. I have now spent um, every year since then in advertising. I'm currently the global executive creative director for BBDO across the Ford business. So um, managing the account and creatives and the work that's done in, um, in just about every country and um, managed through about seven different regions. I've worked on a lot of iconic brands. I ran the M&M's account creatively for about longer than I care to say, maybe 15, 17 years. Um, responsible for um, your nightmares around puppy monkey baby on the Super Bowl, if you can remember that. Um, done a lot of work for Mountain Dew, Mountain Dew Kickstart, Pepsi, um, Lowe's Home Improvement, Visa, and, and a lot of other brands. I'm um, really excited to meet you all and, and share whatever I can. Fantastic. Thank you. Bailey, why don't you go next? Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. Like Rachel mentioned, uh, I, well, I guess I'm Bailey Templin, first of all. Um, but secondly, as Rachel mentioned, I graduated in 2014 as well um, with the advertising degree. Um, I am currently a director of paid search at Jellyfish Digital Marketing. Um, so in this case, a full suite digital marketing service. Um, we are headquartered in US-wise in Baltimore. I'm actually in our Chicago office. Um, and then it's a you know, global brand. We have almost every continent at this point, I think has an office. So we're massively growing um, and you'll find kind of across all of us that the digital space is booming. Um, and I spend most of my time on e-commerce clients across the board. Um, so very excited to talk with all, you all today and hopefully we can answer some of your questions. Great. We do have a fourth panelist, Kathy Heasley joining us. She's having a little bit of technical difficulties, but as soon as she pops on, we'll have her introduce herself as well. And just so everyone knows, my name is Suzanne. I graduated in 2008, and I am currently an account executive at Game Show Network. So it's the television network. So we're really excited to have everyone today. And I think an area that, you know, most seniors really want to know is how did you get your foot into the door? So Lauren, I am just very eager to find out how you got your foot in the door of BBDO. And I need to know whether you got free M&Ms because how cool. <laughs> oh, wow. It was such a different, um, I'm going to say, I'm going to go quickly because I have more knowledge. I've been thinking about this question about how you could get your foot in the door and what you could do for your job search. So I'll just go really quickly. Um, I, after graduation, I worked uh, in a smaller market in Pittsburgh and I um, took them my book, uh, my thesis of um, poems and short fiction and uh, got someone to take a chance on me. 
And when I uh, made the move to New York, I, I literally hit the pavement. And at that time, there was no electronic portfolio. So I was walking around with a giant suitcase of laminated ads and a giant uh, tape. And I, um, uh, I got really strategic about where I wanted to work and how I was going to map my way in there. Um, so we could come back to that a little later on, but yeah. No, we would story. love, we would love to hear based on your experience, you know, years ago and today's kind of world, what would be like your number one to the students on the call on how to get their foot okay. in the door? We want Here's to hear both my, things. if you, if you, <laughs> can you hear me? I'm for, yes. for you. Yeah. So here's what I would say to you. If you remember one thing from me tonight. You are all about, I think, to graduate um, in a major that it has taught you everything you need to know about how to get a job. So think of yourself as a company and you need to turn that company into a brand. That brand needs to have a story and you need to be able to differentiate yourself. Your brand needs to identify what it wants to achieve. So is it you wanna get a job anywhere? Uh, that's a little too vague, is it you want to get a job in your dream field, regardless of where, a little more specific, is it you want to get a job at one of your top 20 companies, regardless of position, like that's a different way in, so just think what would a brand, what would I tell a brand to do, right, so then I, you identify your goal, you identify your story, what makes you different, are you a, a consumer obsessed data infatuated um, graduate that loves where data influences creativity. Okay, that's that. Now we're beginning to tell your story in a really interesting way. What about your experiences are the reasons to believe why you can be that person? Have you um, won contests? Do you have work that you've contributed to? So sort of then your reasons to believe, your experience, your values, your behaviors, how you show up, then the job market is just quite simply your target audience and you need to define that. So um, who are, who are, who's your main audience? Um, is it the HR person at a place? Who is the secondary audience? How are you going to address them? How are you going to meet them where they are? And what story are you going to tell to them? Same thing. So just like create your own brand, know what your goal is, devise a strategy to get there, identify your audience, identify what motivates them. What do you know about them? What is, what is that that keeps them driving? If you don't have all of that information before you reach out to them, do your homework, do your research, just like you would do for a brand, get to know your audience, and then find the point at which your story matches what you know about the audience. So when in doubt in your job search, just say, what would a brand do? What would I tell a brand to do right now? That's so important and really great advice. Okay. And I think also a perfect segue for Kathy to introduce herself and what she does and tell all of us a little bit about yourself. Oh, Kathy, you're on mute. Sorry to have had technical difficulties, but um, okay. yeah, so, you know, um, Lauren's right. You know, everything is a brand. Everything in our lives that we connect with is a brand, including ourselves. We're brand whether we realize it or not. We, we are putting brand vibes out there, uh, whether we, had, uh, you know, realize it or not. So we may as well be deliberate about it, right? Um, so I've spent a long time, 30 years, do, doing brand development, brand strategy, um, all the execution that goes with it, video, books, all, all the different things, because communications is a very, very broad world. And um, I think one of the biggest things for me was I never said no. I always said, yeah, I could do that. And then, of course, I figured out how to do it. And as a result, what was, you know, what came from that was just a lot of different experiences and, and a lot of abilities to do things, just figuring things out, being deductive in, in my behavior. And so, you know, that started with PR writing, you know, I'm like, sure, I'll figure out how to do that and, and did and companies always kind of teach you, you know, so if you are a, an active, excited, excited 
humble yet confident learner, those are words that I would put in my vocabulary when you're interviewing. <clears throat> I am a confident learner. And if you can be a confident learner, um, you can do anything. So that's really how I, I you know, got started in brands that I worked on in, in my um, time period, you know, brands you've heard of like Exxon and um, Coca-Cola and Ryland Homes and Dr. Pepper and oh gosh, you know, um, I forget a, a lot of them, but um, especially the bigger brands just because, well, like Hershey and Kraft and all those consumer brands at one time or another, you know, I've done work for them. But what's really exciting to me is when I get to work on these small startup exciting young brands that are just going places like Amazing Lash Studio, like Cold Stone Creamery was, you know, a decade, a decade or more ago. Um, all these like companies that are just killing it in their tiny little world. And they're so super excited about like their growth and you get to get in there and you get to put your hands in a lot of different places, especially leading up to that, you said, yes. I can do that. And you sat there and figured it out. So that's great. That's definitely great for all the students to know. Two, you know, great points of view. And Rachel, I'd love to ask you, you know, kind of in recent years, how you got your foot in the door. I know MSG is your second, I think, job in the field. So if you could talk about that and shed any light into it. Yeah, so I think probably the two most recent positions that I've had, which is my current one, which I've been at for a year, and then previously I was at Barclays Center and then Brooklyn Nets, I was there for four years. Those are probably my two biggest positions. And in one word, I will say LinkedIn. That to me was how I was able to get my foot in the door. At the Nets, I found a role that I was very interested in, found that I was qualified. I stalked on LinkedIn who the uh, recruiter was, sent him a connection request with a message. You can also find the email extension of someone in the company and apply it to that person. So I applied it to that person and I emailed him. I was one step away from being too aggressive, but I was basically consistently knocking at the door until they answered. And so then that guy answered me and I had two quick interviews, wrote some handwritten thank yous, and I was able to get the job. Like I... I think a big part of it, especially in recent years, is to kind of humanize the process. You feel like you're applying to a screen or a robot or something where you don't know who's gonna respond. There are people on the other end, like we are all people. I don't know who was listening before, me and Suzanne were talking about apartments, we're talking about life. Like we're not these robotic things, like we, we have lives and we have interests and hobbies and passions. And so I think kind of humanizing the experience has really helped me. And I think more recently, as I, I, interview, I was interviewing a lot in 2019 and most of the interviews I was able to get, like I either found someone in HR or I found who the department head was. I look at a, a job, I see what the department is. I see who from the department I can find on LinkedIn, say if they're a Penn State grad, say if there's some we have mutual connections, like that's the one who I might hit. And even more recently for my current role, some, a recruiter actually reached out to me on LinkedIn about it. So I think it really pays to have a cleaned up LinkedIn profile that adequately displays what you're doing, because that's also how you can get noticed. Um, and I think especially for me in the sports and entertainment world, it's a very relationships based uh, industry and very like networking is a big thing of what I do. So even though I have a role now, it's I'm consistently reaching out to people at all levels. I want to continue growing, but yeah, in a sense, LinkedIn, that's it. <laughs> Definitely. And I think what you really honed in on the relationship business, that's really what the comm business is. You know, we mm -hmm. said it in PR last night. I know it's the same in ad across all different parts of the business, creative, sales, branding, you know, there's so many different pieces, but it really all does ring true. Bailey, I'd love to ask you in kind of addition to what everyone else said about getting your foot in the door what do you think is like an agency is the number one thing you guys look for when you hire? I would say the ability to be agile. Um, as you'll, anyone in the industry will find, it is ever changing, ever evolving. No one day is the same as the next. Um, there is 
a lot of, you know, ebbs and flows, ups and downs, you know, new clients in and out the door, um, new projects coming in and, you know, all different paces. And I think the ability, ability to really be agile and accepting of change and evolution is extremely important um, and something that we really look for, you know, in the industry of, you know, agency life, um, being able to be a self-starter determined, but also be able to roll with the punches because, you know, as everyone I'm sure this panel can relate to, there's never two days in a row that are the consistent cookie cutter day to day. Um, and you just have to be willing to ebb and flow as it comes through. Definitely. Lauren, you've been in the business. You've seen so many different things. What's one of your favorite, you know, real life experiences or projects that you've worked on that students could look forward to, you know, eventually doing something similar. What's wait? I missed that you cut off. What's one of my what? What would be your favorite, oh, like a free bar real, at the office? What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> um, just any project or oh, you know, I, I, I have yeah, to say, something like that. Yeah, my my favorite experience, um, and I don't know if I'm breaking up. Um, no, you're is, good. Um, so. Yeah, at BBDO, we do a lot. Uh, we are just sort of always been known for Super Bowl ads. And when I started in 99, that's why I was attracted to it. I love culture and I love when brands don't just uh, mirror culture, but they can help create it. Um, and we had an opportunity, as I mentioned, with um, to launch Mountain Dew Kickstart. Um, it was, it was a niche brand and it was for college kids. And um, suddenly they said, we want to put it on the Super Bowl. And we said, well, that's a horrible mistake because that's not how niche brands operate. Um, but what we did was we created um, an ad at the time, um, which was a meme. Everything about the ad was a meme from the character to the audio track to the camera movements and what happened in it. And half of the audience hated it and just said, what was that outrageous, terrible thing? And the other half, which was our audience, knew exactly what to do with memes. So the minute the ad ran, it just took over the internet and it trended and broke records more I mean, they've been broken since then, but it broke Kim Kardashian's record. It broke all of sort of internet records at that moment. So it was sort of Creatives love also just to get away with something. So putting a ridiculous meme on the Super Bowl for millions of dollars was, uh, and watching culture do with it what we hoped um, they would do with it was really fun. Very cool. And what like a fun real life experience for the students to hear about. Kathy, what about you? You've worked on so many different brands. Is there a project or something that stands out for you? Um. Yeah, you know, uh, so much of what I work on and when I work on it is again, like with these uh, young companies that are coming up. And so a real milestone moment for Cold Stone Creamery uh, way back in the day, apologize for my dog, um, way back in the day was, um, you know, the company was going to be going international. When I started with them, with my company, they became a client. Um, there were 35 stores and by the time the company was sold to private equity, there were over 1400 stores worldwide. And so, you know, that kind of growth in a period of eight years is significant. I mean, you're opening many, many units every day. And, but the one unit that was the most important uh, unit to open was Times Square. And, um, and the reason wasn't because Cold Stone Creamery wanted to make a bunch of money selling ice cream in, in Times Square was because Times Square is a national state or an international stage. So in order for the company to go international, it had to have an international stage. And uh, the location in Times Square was that stage. So pulling together the entire grand opening and all the things that go with it, I'm not talking about, you know, ordering the ice cream and, and uh, scheduling the crew. I'm talking about all of the the PR, the advertising, all of the pre-work that went on in New York, all of the street teams that hit every single business up and down, you know, Times Square and that whole Broadway area, preparing them for what was going to be Cold Stone. And, you know, our goal was to have a big gigantic line around the block when the news stations got there. 
and we were on uh, we were on Good Morning America. We were on CBS This Morning. We were on the Today Show. We had a gigantic um, uh, gigantic creation in the middle of one of I forget which park it was. Um, that it, it, that whole integrated thing down to the ads that were on the the uh, you know jumbotrons in Times Square to the celebrity cavalcade that came in and out of the place, the ribbon cutting, the, the video that we did, the man on the street interviews, feeding ice cream to, to the you know horses that the police are on. I mean, every detail was hit. And that is what created more interest. I think that that activity, now granted it was expensive, just the sign alone on that, on that location is a quarter of a million dollar sign. But, um, that energy launched Cold Stone into China, into Japan, um, into uh, Dubai, into, so that, that investment. Nope. I think she just cut out, but really cool experience working on Cold Stone and kind of going off of Lauren's experience with Mountain Dew and the Super Bowl. Bailey, at your agency doing digital that you focus on, do you kind of go off of these events? Do you plan digital only things? Can you tell us a little bit about your day to day? Sure. So actually it's kind of a mix of both. So you'll have some clients like Lauren and Kathy mentioned that are doing either, you know, in-person or, you know, guerrilla marketing certain events. We do have some clients for example, we did an event with Deckers. So Deckers is the parent company to UGG, Hoka, Teva, the shoe brands. Um, and so we did an event when they launched their fluffy ass. So their big fluffy um, shoe combination, kind of fur sandals. Um, but it was their big launch. And we did help um, do digital for them, both obviously online. So we did our paid search, programmatic, your standard digital, social, um, as well as worked with the team with creative for, you know, their billboards because they did a lot in New York City and such as well. Um, so again, it can be full funnel in that sense, or we also do have, you know, clients that strictly, we just handle their digital. So you're, you know, again, programmatic, social, search. Um, so it's dependent on the client, but we have, you know, done both. And it's one that, we can obviously, it'll, it'll tailor uh, to their needs, but definitely can be at scale if necessary. Very cool. Rachel, what about you? Uh, oh, well, I feel like, cause at MSG, you must have so many different clients, but it's such a known space for, you know, in-person events. How would you say that, you know, balances out? Balances out in terms, sorry, balances out in terms of, digital or in-person activation what what's the I would say difference? like do you find yourself working like on mostly digital is it a mix of like both in person and activation do you have you ever used you know the space to do something really big that's fun yeah so fun fact I started this role in February 2020 so my in-person exposure has been very slim to none uh been quite the interesting year but I think so my role initially was purely in the digital realm, but especially now because of COVID, it's we had to essentially digitize a lot of our other assets. We had, I had to actually know what our in, in arena signage was or what we were doing on the con or in game or whatever, like, cause we essentially needed to figure out a digital solution for it. So I became invested in a lot more um, traditional means, but I think especially now it's, it's interesting to see how much effort will still be on the digital side, even though as fans continue to come back to the arena, I always say that it's, yeah, you're seeing 15 to 20,000 people per night in arena, but we have millions of followers across our social channels. We have a ton of people watching TV, but there are just, there are more eyeballs through screen. So how do you reach them? So I'm interested to see as fans go back how it evolves. Uh, so yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. It's funny as I'm hearing everyone say that the most accomplishing things they've done. I'm like, Oh, if I get asked this question, I don't know. Cause this past year, there's been so much adjusted, like adapting and just navigating. I'm, I'm happy. I'm still here. I'm happy that we figured out some partner solutions. 
I feel like a, a social media post, like I see it on my phone and I feel accomplished, but it's not, it's not this grand, it's not the same scheme as you're sitting in Times Square and cool things are happening. But I will say at my previous role at the Nets, I, I was creating a lot of our sponsorship proposals and using Photoshop to try and mock up what things could look like. And some of the things I wound up creating, or I had to mock up what a barbershop, a pop-up barbershop could look like on the concourse or what <laughs> a suites could look like as, if they were destructed and into a lounge or bar or um the player arrivals as they walk in there's like a brand now on the sideline I had to mock that up and standing and seeing it come to life and being like oh that was something I initially was like how how do I envision this and it really happens or for the player arrivals like all right yeah it's going to be earned and other players are going to post it and like that's how the brand same as goat is um, really going to gain their exposure. And actually LeBron James posted on his own feed a thing with like from that game there. I was like, all right, LeBron posted it. That was so cool. well done. So that made me, that made me happy. (laughs) And I think it's so important that you just mentioned, you know, that in-person activations are great, but with COVID, you know, all of us really had to take a different approach to our business. And I think that's definitely important to talk about. I know when I spoke to the faculty that, you know, joined us for this call, they said, my number one, you know, question from students is COVID. What does the business world look like? Can they still get jobs? So I'm so happy that you did mention it because I do think it's it's relevant. Um, Lauren, with the agency, obviously, you know, COVID must have changed a lot of plans. How did you guys kind of reevaluate and then press forward? I lost you at reevaluate. Oh, just reevaluate and like press forward as an agency, like just move forward. Well, we're um, we're a client-based, you know, client-focused business, so um, it it happened pretty quickly. Uh, I think it took a little while because I'm on the Ford account. We have folks in offices, uh, like I said, across the world and also across the country. So we were already using collaborative tools. Um, so it took some of the other folks who are a little more uh, used to the in-person style a while to get used to you know, Microsoft Teams or Slack or things like that, which was good. I think good for people, but uh, it, it, it transitioned really well. The, the, the places and areas that I continue to focus on and wanna make sure uh, I feel like um, it could be both uh, a pro and a con for uh, young folks without a lot of experience entering the workforce. Uh, A pro is that you get exposure to a lot of meetings and conversations that you might not um, otherwise. The con is that um, a lot of things are happening at a speed at which it might be a little difficult to uh, track and there's not a lot of that. What I miss a lot of, you know, you walk past someone's desk and you're like, hey, what are you working on? Let me see, let me, you know, and it's that, it's that soft touch things that I think um, uh, as far as developing um, people new to the industry that, that I like to focus on because I think that's, that's really one of the things we're missing. But yeah, it's, um, you know, pitching new accounts, doing everything. It's, uh, you just sort of, I think, just keep going figure out how to, how to work it out. Don't spend a lot of time admiring the problem. Um, just start to find solutions and reevaluate at every step what isn't, isn't working. Definitely. Bailey, did you notice since your digital focus, since people were staying home, were your clients just so much more interested in activating campaigns sooner than they might have to really you know take advantage of everyone staying home, being on their devices more? Can you speak a little bit to that? Sure. Um, I would say it was definitely, like Laura mentioned, a an evolution, a quick one, um, and a lot of uncertainty. I think we saw some clients have a booming industry, um, spending three, four times the amount they used to because of how strong their business was post-COVID starting. Um, others, obviously, depending on the industry, some of them had a more difficult time in terms of you know, either inventory or, you know, what their products were being and having to have something in person on their side, things on that front. Um, But yes, I would say a lot of clients really took to digital um, with 
the change to COVID just because like I said, everyone's at home. Um, I think there was a lot of change, especially in terms of kind of your basic technical functions of digital. So being able to control when people are seeing it um, instead of, you know, necessarily on TV, obviously you have flight schedules with digital, you have a little bit more control in terms of when different ads serve and things on that front. So I think it opened a, you know, a few more doors. And um, on that front, like I said, it was definitely a change, um, but a lot of them took to it really well. And I think, I mean, now I, I'm not sure kind of how everyone else feels, but I think a lot of our clients are kind of used to how things are now. And it's interesting to kind of see as things go back to quote unquote normal, um, what that looks like in terms of the evolution back to kind of how things were before, um, or if it's just going to be that further momentum to continue on at the pace that things are now. I completely agree. I know at the start of all of this, you know, I work in television advertising and I really work with direct response clients. So we had some clients, you know, the as seen on TV clients that could not wait to be on air. This was like their yeah. year round Super Bowl. They were like, great, let's get on, let's spend. Then we had other clients that, you know, like in Angie's home, like homeless. And they have people come to your house and perform, you know, tasks for you. So they were like, we want off. Like bath fitter, they come, they put, you know, bathtubs in your home. They were like, ow, like anything in person. They were like, we need to be off air immediately, immediately, immediately. Sure. You know, Booking.com, Trivago. They were like, nope. So, but it was interesting because a lot of the direct to consumer brands then were like, okay, this is amazing. Like you saw Billy spending a lot of money. You saw Ship spending a lot of money. Like yeah. those newer brands that really relied on digital websites to really you know, have people ordering, they were so into it. Yes. So I think it's interesting now that things are getting back to normal and there are more people on air that to your point, the habits that kind of got created haven't really changed. Yeah, so I do find that fascinating. Um, Kathy, what about you? Did you see people react, you know, suddenly anyone kind of want to do different things because of it? Yeah, uh, you know, I have a lot of business to business clients and there are a lot of B2B um, opportunities out there for uh, young graduates. And um, so the first thing that started happening was people started going on Zoom, right? And that's all good. But the, the thing about Zoom was people got used to seeing themselves on video for the first time and they, they became okay with it. That very quickly moved into um, our B2B clients doing product development. Like I, I was involved in a lot of, and still am in a lot of product development to create curriculum for what, they, for what they're about. Um, how do you market to your, your clients when you have just a screen interaction? So a lot of um, you know, doing for sale curriculum, a lot of doing, um, webinars a lot of and and not this kind of webinar like professionally produced webinars webcasts those kinds of things in a studio and the benefit of all of that is that you know now companies are saving tons of money where they used to send you know sales reps all over the world they're, they're saving tons and tons of money having a very effective um you know, relationship with their, with their customers, but it's all done through professional um, cur curriculum and webinars. So one thing I would say to students is, one thing I would say to students is, um, if you can learn how to produce videos, like learn the language of video production, um, produce some, produce some webcasts, produce some webinars, find some great locations because, you know, if you, if, if it's, it's here, it, it's here. People are ready and willing to see themselves on, on video. It's been a long time coming, but it's here. <laughs> no, that's great. Just hearing from everyone's different perspectives and how everyone has different responsibilities within the advertising community. Students, we're kind of curious now to hear your questions and what you want to know more of, or if, you know, someone said something that really piqued your interest please just go to the Q&A box and we can see all of your questions or the chat and just really ask away. I think that 
There were so many different things we touched on, whether getting your foot in the door, you know, how to really stand out among applicants, how to really use LinkedIn to your advantage and, you know, be persistent and really make connections. And also in the era of COVID, you know, how our jobs have changed, but how the industry really has it and how there's still such a big booming industry that's going on with so many different things, whether it's creative or digital or kind of redefining how to really do advertising and the work. It's, it's important to know that the business is still alive and well and good and all of those things. So I see we have our first question and we're gonna answer everything live. And it says, what advice could you give to students who are hoping to work in New York or a big city after graduation, but not sure if they could accomplish it? Does anyone want to tackle this one? I guess I can since like I'm in New York. Is that is that the is that the plea? I mean, yeah. for me, I didn't it took me two years to get to New York. I didn't work here right away. Um, I think it's New York is definitely a place where you have to figure out how you can find a job, but also finance it or fake like you gotta find an apartment that has rent that you like. It doesn't happen overnight, but it happens. Uh, but I think especially in New York, there's a lot like New York, I think for marketing, for advertising, for communications, this is the place to be. A lot of agency headquarters are here, brand headquarters. Um, I'm in the sports and entertainment world. So teams, leagues, agencies, like a lot of things are here. Um, and even so, like I worked in Connecticut before I came to New York. I worked in Philly before I came to New York, but that was always something that I was interested in. So it might not happen right away, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean that if it doesn't happen right after college, it doesn't happen. Um, but I think it's, if you're interested in places in New York, as I said earlier, LinkedIn, find, find the Penn Staters at the company. I think that's also a great way to use, um, search filters. I've definitely utilized that multiple times. But I think it, it'll happen. I think I, I also, I had people older than me who I knew were in New York. My brother was here. I think it, it also helped kind of having resources like that so that I could understand where I was living. I, I was first in Brooklyn before now I'm in Manhattan. Um, so just kind of understanding like where I fit and where I could see myself, but it doesn't have to happen right after graduation. It took me two years, but I'm now five years in and I love it. Um, but yeah, it just, it, it doesn't need to happen overnight, but I think it's definitely something where with rent, like think about it before you jump right in. Cause it, it's a thing. So. <laughs> no, for sure. And I can touch on it a little bit. Um, I graduated in May of 2008 and I started working in New York in October of that year. So I definitely didn't have a job right after graduation. LinkedIn was like just becoming a thing. And I remember stalking people, trying to get like my resume into people's inboxes and going, you know, back and forth to the same place a couple of times to interview. And it's one of those things where, you know, if you want it, that comes out when you interview and someone's going to definitely take notice of that. So, you know, that saying fake it till you make it, it really is true. You know, you've got to believe in yourself and that you could do it. So I would definitely recommend that. Bailey, Lauren, I don't know if you have anything else to share about New York, but Lauren, I loved your Zoom background idea. I think that's such a cool idea and I would totally do that. <laughs> okay. I have some uh, New York sirens behind me. Um, yeah. I would say this, like New York, it, would you show up in New York and say to someone, I wanna eat? tell me where to eat. Well, prior to the pandemic, there would be 10,000 10, choices of restaurants, right? There's 10,000 or more jobs in um, marketing, advertising, and communications in New York. So again, it's like, think about getting specific and, and what gets you excited and the kind of things that, you know, that you like to do, and then find those companies. Um, New York aside, I don't, I don't know of anyone actually going back into the physical office. So the barrier to rents and things like that may not even be a barrier for, for quite a while. So um, use this opportunity to sort of play with the idea of, you know, if there's not mandatory in-person office happening just yet, you could have the New York job experience without having the, 
you know, the New York expense. And that's a huge opportunity to take advantage of. That's a great point. Really good point. Bailey, anything to add before we move on? No, I think they covered off on, I mean, I spent, so I, when I graduated, I actually had an internship. So I was in New York because I'd had an internship in school. So that was kind of, I guess, an opportunity as well. If you can get an internship or a foot in the door while you're in school, I did a remote one uh, with a boutique agency in New York city. And I, you know, started there. Um, so those are, you know, opportunities as well. And like Lauren mentioned, being remote is a complete game changer. Um, and, you know, maybe some of these places that you're looking have a New York office. I know like Jellyfish, we have multiple offices across the country, one being in New York, we have Chicago, we have San Francisco. Um, so we have a lot of different, you know, big city options and, you know, potentially getting your foot in the door in, you know, some other location and being able to transfer. I know at some companies that's an opportunity as well. So, you know, make sure that you're looking at all your options and if it's meant to be, I think it will. It's something I do believe in. If it's meant to be, you'll end up in, you know, that big city. Um, but there's also a lot of opportunities, I think, that people sometimes don't think of because it's not that quote unquote big city experience. But there's a lot of opportunities, I think, that are just as good. And there are a lot of big cities. New York is not the only big city. So <laughs> That's a great point. and a good thing to remember, all really yeah. good points. So the second question we got was, the presentation has been great. Thank you. I know Kathy just spoke about getting those technical digital skills while at school, but what are the top three attributes or skills you look for in a candidate for this industry or specifically your company? Kathy, you want to start with that? Yeah, you know, there's uh, there are a lot of soft skills. Oh, you're on mute, Kathy. There we go. Um, there are a lot of soft skills that are really important. And I'm just going to share with you my very first interview that I ever had with a company. Um, the, the guy who interviewed me walked me into this very intense office, all wood paneled, you know, and designed to scare the, you know, what out of me. It did. <laughs> it, wasn't it. it did. And he asked me, he said, um, would you be afraid of walking into a, a president and talking to them about our products or your pitch. And I hesitated for a moment and I said, no, I wouldn't be afraid. And of course that hesitation was instantly that you would be afraid and I didn't get the job because I wasn't confident and I wasn't able to. So one of the biggest things I think that is, um, that I look for when I'm hiring people is I do wanna see that, that confident um, demeanor, yet at the same time, it's a, such a trade-off, um, a humbleness and a desire to learn. Like I am eager and I have high energy, highest energy wins. You know, I've seen presentations where people just, they sit there and they go, so um, our research shows that we have, no, you have to get people excited. So, you know, willingness to talk to people at a high level, the ability to do that having the energy that is enough, the ability to sell your ideas is critical. This is, this, is a, this is a thing, you have to be able to sell. And then the final thing is um, being able to be persuasive and get people really excited about what you have to offer while at the same time being humble and a, and a confident learner. Those are that like whole little train of me blabbering on is what is really key. No, I think that's so important. I think every time we look to hire, you know, sales assistants and, you know, a PR assistant or a marketing assistant in game show, we really want someone to come in with like such a good attitude, someone that you're going to want to walk by their desk or see them on video and just say, hi, how are you? And have that person just be so excited to be there. I think one of the biggest turnoffs can be when someone comes in for an interview and they're just not excited to be there. You know, we really like what we do in com, right? Like we're so fortunate to be able to do fun things that work every day. And we want to work with someone who's like that. I think to the technical part of the question, I think anything that's technical is always trainable, we say, right? You know, the system I use at GSN, it's, always, it's trainable. I just need someone with the right attitude who wants to be there. And I think that's a really big thing 
that students may not think about when they're first coming out of the gate. And I think it's so important to remember because it's such a great attribute that someone can have and not everyone has it. Lauren, Bailey, anything to add to that? Yeah. I'll add one tip. Um, a lot of the places you'll be interviewing um, make a lot of what they care about uh, public information on their websites. Uh, for instance, BBDO is a place that cares about the work, the work, the work. That's our mantra. And then we have the people values. There are 11 of them. And without saying it, when people are interviewed, um, everyone's keeping in mind how much you care about the work, what's your relationship to the work, and what people values do you have? So our people values are things like a radiator, not a drain, right? You show up radiating energy. Um, a hand raiser, not a finger pointer, right? So um, you may find that you don't have to be all things to every company, but you may go on their website or go on their LinkedIn and find out just how you can use your strengths to talk about what matters to them. That's great. I love I'd the say, drain analogy so far. Yeah, I like that. Um, and I would echo great. off that. I always like to find people who are informed, not just about the company you're interviewing for, but like about the industry in general and what's going on. And I actually, it's funny, I bombed a, this question early on in my interviewing stages. I remember they asked me to talk about some sponsorship examples just overall in the industry. And I spent so much time studying the specific place I was interviewing for that I couldn't think of anything else. And that to me really just opened my eyes to like, all right, I gotta make sure that I am really educated, not just here, but about everywhere. And now I think to this day, it's like, now I read several newsletters. I read either sports business or partnerships. Then I read ad week. I read um, morning brew. Like there, I'm not reading just about my field and about my team. I'm reading about anything that could be relevant and curating the feeds I follow to be informed. And so I know a question that I like to ask uh, people who are applying is just what do they see out there that's interesting? And I think it's just the people who can riff and have these people, you gotta be looking, you gotta be paying attention. Um, and I agree with some of the other um, answers. So like, I, I like a yes person. I, I feel like I'm not gonna ask you to get me coffee. A, I don't like coffee, so that's not happening, but I'm also just not gonna do that. But I think it's, whether it's helping to pull data or it could be like a minute task, but it's still just, being able to say yes, and then also being able to like give a task and be able to try and learn it yourself. Or if you have questions, like make sure they're well thought out questions, not just you sit there and you're like, oh, where do I start? It's try and then come back to me. Uh, Cause I have a full-time job. Managing you is not my full-time job. I have other things to do. So it's how do you say yes? And just be informed. Cause I feel like almost every time you're going to get it answered, ask what you think is uh, interesting out there. Definitely. And Rachel, I know you have to leave us at seven. Ooh, yes. So any yeah. other parting words that you want to share with everyone before you hop off? Ooh, um, I don't know. I mean, I know it's, it's, it's a tough time out there, but I think like this time, like time heals time, like you're going to look back on this phase in your life and it's going to feel like such a small time. Like I moved to New York five years ago and what was it? Six years ago, I was working in Connecticut. I was pretty miserable. I was crying where I was at. I was not happy, but I look back and that was six whole years ago. Like that was such a long time ago. So I know that this time may seem tough, but you're going to and grow out of it. You're going to be, you're going to be a stronger person. And I think, I also think anyone who sees a resume of like a 2020 or 2021 graduation date, I don't think they're going to be asking about specific experiences or qualifications. They're going to be asking like, what did you do during that time? How did you learn about yourself? What what are your takeaways from this time? Because I just, I don't think it's going to be what's what A, B, C, what are the job? Like, no, I want to, I want to know what you did. I want to know, I want to know why you're better now than you were before the pandemic. So I just, this too will pass. So I think that's the, that's what I'll part you with. That's a great note. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think that anyone who's looking for new grads, who's hiring right now, it's much more of, okay, you know, how did you get through this time? You know, what did you read? What did you learn? What new skill did you pick up? Whether it's super related to the field or you learned a new language or you learned how to play an instrument or anything that really 
you can explain about yourself that leads that person to be okay like this person is hardworking and dedicated and wants to learn and if they wanted to learn during this tough time they're going to want to come and work for me and learn even more so i think that's really interesting and a good fact thank you so much rachel for participating right. too. Thanks. thanks no problem thank you for having me um sure. and uh feel free to reach out linkedin is great that's another networking tool if you listen to people on a panel you can follow up on linkedin but add a note to it otherwise i'm not going to know how i met you so that's what i will leave you with great note great notes Leo. bye everyone so we just, it looks like we got another question. Oh, nope, not another question. So I'm going to throw it to Bailey. And I'm going to say in this digital age where everything has been such a focus online, what can you say to the students on the call about digital that really makes you interested in it? Like, how did you become interested in it? For yeah. me, I'm a television person, so I know nothing really about it. So I'm curious too. Sure. So actually, I started out in traditional. Um, so I can say I've done I've seen both sides. Um, I started out in traditional. And by chance, it's actually a Penn State story. Um, my senior year, I took the Google online marketing challenge course, which at the time existed. I don't think it does anymore. But it was the first time I handled real budget for a client. You know, at the time, it's kind of funny, it was like $200 for four weeks. And I was, we were all panicked, like $200. And in hindsight, and even in the industry, you'll, you'll laugh when you see like budgets later, but in hindsight, it was like a big deal. Um, and I think what intrigued me was it was interesting. It was fun. And um, there was a lot of, you know, there was creativity and transparently, I was never the artist. I was, I could doodle, but I was never going to be great at Photoshop. And so I kind of found my niche in search by chance. And that's actually how I got my job going back to the original question leverage your professors. So my professor actually helped me get a foot in the door at Jellyfish. He knew one of the recruiters. And so here I am six years later there. So kind of a, you know, side note from that part is, you know, leverage your professors. They have a lot of knowledge and they also have a very big network. Um, so kind of tying it all together, network there. Um, but in terms of what kind of keeps me here now. So I, like I said, I love the fact that it's not the same thing twice. There's some projects that are huge, some that are smaller, but I think the biggest thing is realizing, first of all, we're not saving lives, truth, you know, transparently, there are some stressful days, but you know, I'm, I'm not saving lives or anything. So I can leave happy and, you know, it's great when you see clients happy and you see your success, cause you can, you know, quantitatively, you'll find out what that is. Um, and so I think that's huge. And then, like I said before, like digital is not going anywhere. So I think because of that, there's a lot of opportunity, especially for newer grads. That's something that I noticed was digital's newer, like the industry itself is pretty young. And so there's a lot of opportunities in digital for younger, less kind of less experienced in a sense, just because it's a newer platform. Um, so a lot of opportunity, a lot of areas for growth and you know, you can prove yourself. And so I think it's great. And there's a lot of passion, I think, across advertising as a whole. And you'll find it again in the digital realm. So definitely keeps me excited and something that I'm passionate about. So that's great. No, it's it's so cool to me. There's so many different, you know, facets to what we do and just different ways to do really interesting things. And I think on this call tonight, we really had so many different areas represented. And it just goes to show that you know, to the students on the line, you know, you're in your classes, you're learning about agencies, you're learning about media buying, but there's so much more to what you can do, right? There's just so many different paths that you could take. So on that note, because we're coming up on an hour, and if it's as nice as it is in State College, as it is in New York today, I know everyone wants to get out. So I'd love for each panelist just to leave you know, some lasting words on things that you would recommend to students. And let's just go from there. Kathy, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, so I wrote in the chat notes that um, learn to write. Learn to write. Be a writer. And I'll tell you a good reason why. Because most CEOs and most people in high level leadership, they don't like to write. They don't have time to write. They can't write. They do not think like a writer. 
And so for me, I found out I was a good writer. And when I uh, got into even my very first few jobs, once, once these executives realized like you're a writing resource, guess what? You are brought in to a lot. These people become like, some people have asked me like, who are your mentors? I have had no formal mentors, but I have had a hundred, I have had 200 mentors because all these super high level people call you in and they go, you know, Kathy or whoever, I need a, I need you to write something. Okay. Well, tell me what you want. Tell me what it is. And you learn from all these people, you become indispensable to these people. And so if you want to advance quickly, become a writing resource to all these people who hate to write, don't have time to write and can't put a sentence together. I, I, it's as simple as that. I, I tell people when you know how to write, you can write your ticket in the corporate world. Great advice. And something everyone can learn how to do well. Mm -hmm. Lauren, what about you? Yeah, I'll just say, I know the job search is uh, a really, if, if that's where you are, is just can be a really overwhelming um, thing to enter into. And, and particularly now when no one's in offices and no one's answering work phones and everything has changed. But I would just keep going back to every lesson that you learned at Penn State is a lesson you just need to apply to yourself. Um, I was mentoring a student uh, not that long ago, and she wanted to go into, um, uh, she was interested in event, event marketing. And, but her real question was about how she can get people to, um, how does she begin to reach out to people on LinkedIn? And I said, well, imagine you're an event planner and you want to land a band or a, you know, Coldplay or someone for your event what would you do? What strategy would you have? Would you, you know, you can't pick, call Chris Martin on the phone and say, hey, so you come up with a strategy, you network, you find the through line to, you know this, you know that, you graduated from Penn State. Oh, you work at Spotify. That's really interesting. So just, just exhale and just think everything that I learned at Penn State about how I could build a brand, make a brand special, differentiated, approachable, connect with audiences. Um, I'm just going to do that for myself and then create a little strategy for yourself and um, use trial and error because what might work with me, um, which is really simply going to be, hey, Lauren, I saw that we, you know, you went to Penn State, I went to Penn State, you know, and then something really human right after that, I'm going to answer. Um, that might not work for someone else. Um, you might need to stroke their ego and say, Hey Lauren, I just saw the new Ford Mustang Mach-E campaign, and wow, that was like, you know, can you tell me a little, you know, whatever? Um, so just have fun with it and play around and try to try to make that personal connection and that network because I think um, we probably all got our starts in some ways or jobs in some ways by by having that uh, that that connection and and not. I like to think of the resume in HR as the ad equivalent of taking out a piece of paper and putting it on a telephone pole. Like that's table stakes, that's nothing. Where do you go from there? Who do you talk to? Who, who are the mid-level people? Who are the people who just graduated? How can they give you a tip or a trick about that company that opens another door that introduces you to someone else? So apply all those great advertising and branding skills that you learn, just apply them to yourself. Great advice. I completely agree. You know, Bob Martin sometimes will do introductions with students to me via email. I've had students reach out to me and say, hey, you know, can I meet you for a cup of coffee? And I always say yes, always. You can't say no to a Penn State student. So please, if you see any Penn Staters working at your dream company, like Rachel said, Drop them a line on LinkedIn, like Lauren said, add in something cool about where they work. And I guarantee you they will write back. And it's such a great feeling. So I definitely highly recommend that advice. Bailey, any final thoughts? I would say mine's short, mine's short and sweet, but um, find what you're passionate about and follow it because as silly and cliche as it may sound, there's probably something that aligns with your passion in this industry. Sometimes I think we kind of picturesque, kind of like the big city example. We picture, you know, working on the biggest agencies in New York City. And while yes, they're awesome, 
um, and some lucky people get to do it. Unfortunately, there's not enough spots for everyone. It, ju it just is. Um, so find what you're passionate about and being able to, you know, really make it into your next role. Um, it'll make it less of a job and more of something you're actually intrigued and interested in. Um, and overall, it just is helpful. And like everyone else mentioned, network um, and make sure that, you know, you're putting your best foot forward and that's all you can do. Definitely. Well, I want to thank everyone who spoke on tonight's panel and volunteered their time for us. Thank you so much. Rachel, Kathy, Bailey, Lauren, you guys are rock stars. We appreciate it. To everyone still with us on the line, please, like we said, don't be afraid to LinkedIn us to reach out and we'd be happy to get back to you with specific questions. So have a great night, everyone. Bye.